Get the home field advantage every time with Fairfield by Marriott, official hotel partner of the NCAA. Whether you're a student athlete working toward your championship dreams or your team's biggest fan, Fairfield by Marriott has everything you need to get ready for game day. From comfortable guest rooms to complimentary hot breakfast, Fairfield is part of the Marriott Bonvoy portfolio of hotels and official hotel partner of the NCAA. Visit fairfield.marriott.com to book your next game day stay. Welcome into The Verge, a show which covers the Baltimore Orioles minor leagues. The Verge is part of BSL Radio. Baltimore Sports and Life is dedicated to analysis and discussion on the Orioles, Baltimore Ravens, and the University of Maryland. The site has a team of writers providing coverage of those teams and houses live streaming content weekly. Join the conversations at the message board, like BSL on Facebook, and follow BSL on Twitter. On Twitter. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A lets us be more creative on another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Welcome to On the Birds. This is Zach Spedden, joined as always by Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens. On tonight's episode, we're joined by Bowie Bay Sox broadcaster Paul Fritzner, who's going to help us break down the Orioles' very good double-A club. And, of course, we're going to talk about the news that Adley Rutzman has been promoted to triple-A Norfolk. All of that is coming up in a moment, but first, On the Birds is brought to you courtesy of Mercer Floor and Home Carpet One. Mercer is a third-generation family business that was established in 1959 and is located on Main Street in beautiful, historic downtown Westminster, Maryland. For all of your flooring needs, think Mercer. Now, uh, Bob, before we get into tonight's show, uh, we do want to give another shout out to our Patreon subscribers. We appreciate your continued support, and we want to welcome some of our new members. Yeah, you know, you guys keep supporting us, and it, it's really great to see. We got 12 new patrons for this week after last week, uh, starting with some random guy named Dan Spedden. No relation, I'm sure, to anybody here. Um, MJ Lipinski. Robert Phelan Sr., again, no relation, I have no idea. <laughs> Tina Montag, Ben du- Duerst, I'm guessing it's pronounced. Shout out to Ben, he's good on, on Twitter, Oriole status. Adam Wolf, Elric Williams from the UK, Ryan Setry from the Talking Birdie podcast, shout out to them. David Almquist, Brandon Stoneberg, Drew Edwards, and Alakon Salahai. So thank you guys, really appreciate it, and feel like you know if you ever have any criticisms or stuff you want us to do get at us and we'll do it that's the yeah. benefits yeah thank you very much for your support and i'll now introduce tonight's guest he is the broadcaster for the Bowie bay Sox. you can hear him and adam paul on the call and for the radio as well as milb tv he is paul fritzner paul how are you hey i'm doing fantastic first of all i want to give you guys a shout out for one uh, the recognition you guys got from the Orioles front office, of course, Mike Elias giving you guys a shout out. That's great for you guys. And I think that's just a microcosm of the coverage you guys have had this year. I know, you know, when I sign off the air and I take a look at your guys' Twitter account and see how the rest of the, the system did, it's always great for me knowing who's coming up, who's going down, everything, how guys are playing. So you guys have done a great job building a brand this year, and it, it's fun to be on. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure, to have, you. pleasure to have you here. Um, so we'll just start with the big story, which is the news that Adley Rutzman is going to be promoted to AAA Norfolk. Uh, what are your thoughts on the move, and are you surprised that it happened now, or were you expecting this? No, I'm not. I'm not surprised at all. I think it, we were kind of at a point in the season where it was kind of coming any day. I think we were all sort of ready for it at any time. You know, maybe if he had gone up one week later, one week sooner, it didn't really matter. I, I was I was ready for it. I was not surprised at all. Uh, that he goes up now. I mean, 18 home runs on the year. Defensively, he's ready. I mean, do you want to say he's major league ready defensively right now? Maybe. I mean, his ability to block pitches, call a game, manage a game, the relationship he builds with his pitchers, 
all of those things combined, I mean, he has just shown a tremendous ability at the double A level uh, to do that. And, you know, he's starting to pick his average a little bit. He struggled a little bit with the average in July, but uh, had a great start to the season, especially hitting for power. The power numbers dipped a little bit through like the middle of June and the middle of July. But, you know, in the last couple of weeks, he's really picked that up, wins the double A Northeast League's player of the week uh, uh, a few weeks ago. So all that combined. I think with 48 games left in Norfolk and the way that that season's going and then to finish in triple a build that relationship. And like I put in that tweet thread that I tweeted earlier, I mean, there's so many guys on that Norfolk staff right now that have been in booby. You look at Braddish, Bauman, Smith, uh, Ophelke Peralta is there right now. Nick Vespi, David LeBron, so many guys that he's already caught this year with Bowie that are up at triple a. I don't think it's a shock at all that he's getting the time those those last about fifty games uh, down in Norfolk. Yeah, I think just one thing that I've noticed. I'm going to go off script here a little bit, but uh, for uh, Zach and Bob. But one of the things that I appreciate, especially with you and Adam calling the games, like the professionalism, of course, the excitement, uh, the, how informative all of your broadcasts are. I always walk away from a buoy game learning so much more than what I went into the game with. Um, but I also get the sense that both of you are like legitimate real fans of this team and of a lot of these guys. <laughs> so like, were there ever a moment, especially maybe when like Grayson's pitching to Adley Rodriguez or sorry, Grayson's pitching <laughs> to Adley Rutschman who would create a super baseball player here. Um, did you ever sit back and, and just like really just like fan it up a little bit? How hard, how difficult was that for you to sit back? And, like I'd have to call this game. Uh, right way and not just completely fan out all the time. Well, I think that's what makes a good broadcaster, right? Like you have to bring that professionalism to the broadcast, but at the same time, we're just a a voice of the fan, right? I mean, we're here to bring the excitement. We, we don't want to sit here and, and bore everybody. If you're tuning into a minor league baseball game, it's because you care. It's because you want to watch those guys. It's because you want to be excited about the future of the Orioles. It's because you want to be excited about the prospects in the system. And there's nowhere better for that right now than in Bowie, right? Everybody, or at least over the last few weeks, a lot of the guys have started to be promoted. Uh, but, you know, especially in the beginning of the year, the pitching staff and everything like that, the future of the Orioles this year has been in Bowie. So you don't want to go into the games every night and, and just – go in there lackluster and everything like that. You want to bring the energy. You want to sit there. And, and you also have to appreciate, like you said, that you're watching what could be generational talent pitch in front of you in, in front of a few thousand fans, you know, in random cities across the East Coast that in a few years are going to be, you know, headlining at, at, at Camden Yards, at Fenway, at Yankee Stadium, you know, all the way around the major leagues that these guys are going to be, you know, potentially, depending on how they pan out, could be uh, faces of baseball. Uh, you know, th those that's the potential of some of these guys when you look at Grayson, Adley, could throw DL in there. You know, all these guys that that are just so, so good. And, and you hope as an Orioles fan that it pans out. But when you're sitting there on the broadcast, you certainly have to take a step back and realize who you're watching what kind of a start they're getting when Grayson Rodriguez is going out there and and uh, you know striking out twelve batters? I was joking with Adam last night. Actually, that was my one weekend off, and uh, I, I checked in on the box score and I saw Adley uh, or Grayson had struck out twelve guys in a game. And Adam was not with me for this past Grayson start. And Adam asked me, "Well, how did he look? You know, in person in Somerset because was, that was the first time we'd been on the road." And uh, he said, I said, well, you know, I didn't see him pitch Neary. You saw that, but I have to imagine what I saw last time was just as good up this week in Somerset. He was fantastic in four and two thirds innings. So, you know, you, that's a long winded way to say as a broadcaster in minor league baseball, you don't get. And now, granted, this is my first year. Adam's been around a whole lot longer than I have. Right. I mean, he has way more experience with talent and got, calling guys like Machado, Weeders, Bundy, all those guys that he has worked with and seen through the through the minor leagues. And, and for this to be my first year in affiliated baseball and to work with this kind of a team and get to know these guys as much as I can, you have to take a step back and realize what you're watching because of what the potential could be for them in a few years, right? Yeah, you're spoiled. What are you going to do after the season? <laughs> I know, right? It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I think just you mentioned all these prospects, and there are more coming up. You know, you say, what are you going to do now? I mean, there's still Gunnar Henderson, Jordan Westberg, your Heston Kerstads, 
Colton Cowser's raking down there in the Florida Complex League. A lot of guys coming up, but you mentioned this is your first year with Bowie, all these prospects you get to watch. I mean, is it watching these guys every night been the most kind of, uh, uh, you know, the biggest joy of this season for you? Or what's been the biggest uh, positive this season for you being a, a first year broadcaster with the Bay Sox? Well, I sure lucked into a great spot. I'll tell you what, with the way the Orioles are building and you look around at some of the other double A teams and how many prospects they might have on their team. And I talked to some other broadcasters and you look and I think there's there's a lot of factors as to why Bowie is such a great spot. And for one, you're close to your home, your home park. You're, you're so close to your home team the, and the Baltimore Orioles for whether it be for rehabs. You know, we saw Anthony Santander earlier this year. We've seen rehab starts uh, come through this season. So you're close for that. You're close to be able to build relationships with people with the Orioles. And so professionally for me, that's been great. And, uh, you know, as a product on the field, it's been even more fun to watch because you see how many of these guys are building relationships with each other, not just because they're playing well on the field together, but I mean, look at the Instagram posts, right? I mean, Adley, Grace, and DL, the, what they go back and forth on Twitter, Newstrom, you name it, any of them, all the way down the line, how close this group of guys are. And I think that's what, what, maybe Orioles fans could get really, really excited about is that not just that they're producing individually because the minor leagues, everybody always talks about oh, in the minor leagues, you just want to produce, you just want to get better. It's all about development, whatever, but there is a little something to winning at the minor league level. And for the most the vast majority of the beginning of the season into June, into late June, Bowie was the best team in minor league baseball and they fell off a little bit. Um, they kind of come back to the pack a little bit, but guys got promoted and that's what happens but yeah it's been so much fun adam's been great to work with uh you know figuring out how to manage these guys and all of that stuff it's been it's been a great first year. it's it's almost been too good of a first year right <laughs> absolutely well for anyone watching us live just you know send in your questions and we'll get to them when we're done with ours and then we'll tack them on at the end but for me great yeah you talk about grayson rodriguez and he was sensational in his last start. I mean, I watched that game. <laughs> the strike zone was a little tight. It seemed like he got squeezed quite a bit on a lot of those pitches, but he worked right through it and gave up one hit, one walk with like nine strikeouts. But uh, the numbers tell us how dominant he's been. But in getting to see him in person as often as you do, what uh, what do you think it is that makes him so successful? <laughs> Well, he's competitive, and as far as an intangible goes, I don't know if I had seen him as upset as I saw him the other day when he came off the mound after four and two-thirds innings, and he was furious because he wanted to finish off that fifth inning, and he just couldn't do it, and the Orioles have the pitch limits in the minor leagues and all that, and and so that competitiveness and that fire in him – you know, you you don't get that in conversation with him because he's so buttoned up. He's so professional. He's so well spoken. He he has his manners are great. Everything like that. He's so professional. But man, when you get him out on the mound, he he's just he's so competitive and he wants to win so badly that that translates over into his game. And I think that's what really separates his good starts from you know when we saw a couple of his starts where he went like an inning and two thirds and he went two innings in his next one before this last outing and his two outings before that it, it was just kind of like it, his control maybe wasn't there a little bit and and it was so close to getting out of the start before it where he allowed four runs in an inning he was one out away from getting out of that inning before he got pulled um so when he pitches with power when he comes at you with that upper 90s fastball and then he's breaking off those breaking pitches that hitters just have so much trouble picking up He's tall. He's physically imposing on the mound. Um, and, and then he has just such power in his pitches that he has it all put together, right? He's got command of all of his pitches and he goes out and he doesn't get rattled and he knows exactly what he's going to do. He always has a plan. And it's cool watching him and Adley pitch, too. I mean, again, that goes back to what we were just talking about, too. But those guys just always on the same page together. Um, so going back to a player you mentioned earlier, Robert Newstrom. After a somewhat slow start this year, he really picked up, um, really became a, a great hitter, and he's carried that over to Norfolk. Um, when did you start to notice that he was turning around, and is this something you think is going to last? I sure hope it is because uh, he's a fantastic, uh, just a fantastic guy. I got to know him really well over the course of the year. Um, he was just, he was great to work with. He was fun to watch. It didn't matter where you put him in the lineup. The beginning of the year, he was down in like the, eight seven eight spot and so many guys were getting on in front of him that he just had 
crazy chances to drive in runs. I mean, you look at his RBI total and we would talk about it because I mean, he would be down there in the seven, eight spot. And you're thinking, okay, well, he's got four or five guys in front of him that are just always on base. So he always comes up with a guy, two guys on base and he's driving them in and he's, he's hitting for power. I remember he told me, uh, I don't remember exactly when it was maybe towards the end of June, um, probably a few weeks before he got called up. And I was asking him about some of his power stuff. I said, man, you, you know, you're really hitting the ball into gaps. Is there really, is there anything you want to fix with your swing right now? And he said, I really just want to start hitting more home runs. Like I want to hit for power. And sure enough, over the next two, three weeks, I mean, it was another four or five home runs that he hit in those next couple of series. And that was eventually what led to this promotion out of Norfolk. And you see him picking up exactly where he left off in Bowie. And you know, he's not a prospect. He's not a big name guy. But he's certainly somebody that he's turned a lot of heads. And if he can, t- it, it's one of those things where if he keeps this up way he's playing right now, I mean, you can't, I don't want to say you can't keep him down this year. I, mean, I don't know if you bring him up this year, but if he keeps producing at this level, you can't keep him down because, I mean, he, I know it's a crowded outfield in Baltimore. I know that's where a lot of guys are right now. You know, and I know there's a lot of shuffling that might have to be done. But even just to give him a shot, I mean, he he has certainly had a breakout season this year. It's great to see for him. Yeah, I mean, who would you rather have, uh, Robert Newsom right now or Yusniel Diaz, who's been struggling and hurt all season? So he's he's definitely made a name for himself, and that raw power is real. Yeah, yeah, for oh yeah, for sure. And, and four hundred and seventy six feet in 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 Hartford, four hundred and seventy six feet. I was texting uh, one of the stats guys with Bowie the next day, and we weren't at the game. And so I just kind of assumed it, the camera, the way the camera angle panned out, you could tell that the ball went out of the stadium. And I was sitting there and I was going, all right, this went a long way, but we don't have the stats in front of me. You know, I don't have the stats in front of me um, in an away game like that when I'm sitting here in Bowie calling the game. And so I'm saying, all right, well, it's had to have gone a long way. So about, you know, two, three o'clock the next day, I texted our stats guy and I said, hey, you have any idea how far Newstrom's home run went yesterday? And he was like, yeah, it went 476 feet. And I said, what so i mean <laughs> immediately i was clipping getting that out and it was on sports center that night so yeah and, uh he, he certainly has the power that's for sure love that and i think he almost hit one out of in jacksonville out of the stadium the other day too so <laughs> love to see him it's, it's just what he does um great story for sure uh is there anyone that you've been able to watch this year that who would you consider your most pleasant surprise on this buoy team this season um you know, I, I guess, uh, and it's a shame he's been hurt the last couple of weeks, but Patrick Dorian has really had a breakout year. I mean, he looked like Babe Ruth in the month of May. Um, he was, I mean, he was hitting home runs left and right. And then the power numbers kind of came back down to earth. But what he started to do, and, and Adam and I talked about this a lot on the broadcast, um, you know, Adam started noticing how he was shooting the ball the other way. And then I started looking at the stats and I was saying, you know, the power numbers are starting to pick back up. And you realize the more and more Dorian was hitting to the opposite field, he was starting to hit everything to the opposite field instead of what he was doing in the beginning of the year where he was pulling everything and he was hitting all these home runs down the right field line. As a left-handed hitter, he was starting to drive the ball into left field. And when he was doing that, you know, he was hitting balls off the wall. He was driving in runs. He was hitting opposite field home runs. And that kind of changed the second half of his season around. He plays a great third base and you might look, you know, at a couple of the errors that he's made this year, if you look at his his defensive totals, I don't even have a problem with some of the errors he's made because it's just because of how he plays defense. He's just been extremely aggressive at times. And, and I've talked about that where, you know, he's just so aggressive that, you know, sometimes he, he goes home with a ball when it's close and, you know, on a ball that he's charging in. But, man, on weak ground balls down the third base line, and he comes in and has to throw across his body. kind of reminds me of Ryland Bannon where – those are just automatic for him and, and defensively the power that he has at third base. It was a great, great thing to see, to see how well he was playing, especially through the first two thirds of the year. Now, does he pass the eye test in your mind as somebody that could be successful as he moves up? I mean, you know, that that's a tough question just because, you know, and that's something that I've really talked to Adam a lot about this year with, you know, being in the minor leagues and working in it every day and and this being my first year in minor league baseball and seeing what the, you know, farm directors and everybody looks for in skills that can progress. And I've heard from 
many, you know, different people talking back and forth about, you know, what can Dorian do? What can he do? And it, there doesn't seem to be any negative sentiment ab- about Dorian and his ability. I'll put it that way. But, um, you know, I, I think if he just continues hitting for power the way he is and and defensively, if he's as good and sure as he is with the glove down at third base, um, that's going to carry his career a long way. And and what the Orioles decide to do with him, you know, I, I don't know. And that's just something that experience in the minors for me and, and getting to know this organization will probably pay off a little bit more. But uh, but yeah, I guess to answer your question, it, it's kind of along the Newstrom lines where if he keeps hitting like he is right now, it's it's going to be tough to to keep him at this level. Yeah, he's got that power. I saw him hit an opposite field home run on Father's Day in Bowie, and he's got a higher walk rate than Adley Rutschman right now. So yeah, yeah. I mean, he might be batting 250, 245, but the power and the walks, that's a good combination to have. Exactly. Um, let's see. Uh, Joey Ortiz, talk about him. He was putting together a great season before getting hurt. Uh, we know his future depends on the development of his bat, obviously, but is the glove as good as advertised? Yeah, and and watching him and Caden Grenier play up the middle at, at shortstop and second base was so fun, and it's a real shame. You know, that's when you look back at this season and you think maybe what if. Um, I, I think the Joey Ortiz question might be my biggest what if just because – of how well he was playing, uh, how well he handled himself with the bat, the power that he hit with, his ability, you know, the middle infield defensively. He 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 was special, and he wasn't even in Bowie that long before he got hurt. Um, and it, it was just a shame to, to see. You knew whatever happened to him was serious enough because he tried. He, he got hurt. He came out, and he tried again. And then you saw him walk off the field, which – to me, I think is the only time I've seen a player walk off the field mid game uh, with a trainer this year. And Joey walked off in the middle of a game because whatever at the time we didn't know uh, was hurting him, uh, was hurting him just too badly. And and that was a real shame to see because he was having such a breakout season uh, and in just a short time in Bowie. But uh, the injury now it's, you know, how do you, how do you recover from that? How do you work back? And uh, what do you do again if he comes to Bowie out of the injury? So I have to imagine that the last year or so has really been unusual in a lot of ways because of the pandemic. What has it been like to work for and cover this team uh, throughout the pandemic? You know, that's a great question. Um, it's It's been very uh, unique. Uh, you know, it's it's been a, a very unique experience because – you know, I'm still just the other day, uh, you know, on the road in Somerset, there were still guys that I would go up and be like introducing myself to that have been with us for most of the season where, you know, I have to text guys for interviews or I have to say, you know, let them know like, hey, you got to go do this. or You got to go do that. But as far as as actually getting to know a lot of these guys, it's been so unique because that's usually something as a broadcaster you do within the first homestand of the season. You introduce yourself to everybody, get to know everybody you know, figure out everybody's personalities pretty quickly. But this year with very, very limited access to the players, um, I mean, I, I do get to talk to them. I do get to be down and, and around them. You know, I'm vaccinated. I can wear a mask. I can be down and, and around them as much as I can. But, you know, I can't be like on the bus. I, I can't ride the bus to the away games. I have to drive myself. Um, so you're not building that kind of a camaraderie or anything like that. So, you're you're working extra hard this year to find the stories that you can online to read as much as you can from stories that have been written about these players. Um, it's just a very unique situation that hopefully finds itself, you know, resolved in the near future next season. Um, but you make the you make the most of it, right? Like last year we didn't have baseball, so I, I'm not going to sit here and, and complain about it for sure. But it's it's been. Uh, it's been a very unique year, and I know I've said that now three times, but it's that's the best word to describe it because in a normal year, you're going down, you're hanging around batting practice every day, you're standing around the cage, you're talking to the manager, you're talking to the pitching, you know, and it's this year, it's it's just been a lot of texting, it's been a lot of phone calls, it's been a lot of just trust on both sides to make sure we get stuff done, and, you know, hopefully that doesn't have to happen into the near future, but who knows? Yeah, I think to go off that too, I was thinking about this. You know, I saw, you know, CBS News coming out and doing that story uh, at uh, Paul, Prince George Stadium and 
you know, minor league baseball has undergone a lot of changes recently. And, you know, there's lots of discussion about, you know, player pay, which you know, we could do a whole you talk about this every single day. I get that. But from Bowie's perspective, you being here, I know 2020 was just a disaster for every minor league club. You guys rely on ticket sales and fans coming in and spending money to keep operations going. But for from the Bowie Baysox perspective, uh, how has this year been? I mean, are things looking up are things back to semi-normal or you know is it still kind of kind of rough sledding for a lot of minor league teams well i think uh i think to answer the question the bay Sox rely a lot on group sales and what's the one thing you can't do right now in covid you can't have groups and and now there have been groups coming out you know as things have been relaxed but i'm just meaning you know from the beginning of the year and the off season you plan on big groups. That's what you spend your off season doing a lot, you know, selling group sale, all that stuff. And, and certainly over the last, you know, month or two, as things have opened up, the groups have started to come back out. But uh, you know, what, what I have noticed this year and and Adam and I have talked about this, um, you know, a lot with, with the way that sales and everything have gone is that the individual ticket sales are up this year and the baseball IQ of the fans in Bowie, you feel like everybody is coming to watch the games because they want to watch, you know, in minor league baseball, you talk about the promotions, you talk about the bobbleheads, you talk about the, you know, in between innings, the, the national anthem brings a whole group, you know, all that stuff. But this year in Bowie, the baseball fans that want to come out and watch a game, it is, they're baseball crowds. Adam uses that term a lot, that they're baseball crowds that want to come out and watch these games because of how good this team is. And you're also able to watch the future of the Orioles for pretty cheap and, and it's affordable. And when you ask about things being back to normal, you know, I, I know in that CBS story that they did about it, they talked about how, there's there are teams in minor league baseball and and I don't think anybody is exempted from this there are teams in minor league baseball that are going to take years and years to come back from this and and some may never fully financially recover from the damage that was done last year i mean you look bowie did not have a public event from the end of the 2019 season when bowie played trenton in the 2019 championship series until opening day of this year that was the only I mean, there were no, that was the first public event of the entire pandemic from the end of the 2019 season to the beginning of the 2021 season. You've seen some other, some other stadiums in different places have, you know, they did, I mean, I, in, in Cincinnati, there was a minor league stadium in, in Northern Kentucky that did uh, you know, a petting zoo. Um, There were some stadiums that did like, you know, beer sales, things like that. Bowie had no, you know, public events over the entire course of the pandemic. So trying to work back from that, um, you know, it was huge for Bowie, obviously, to still be affiliated with the Orioles um, to be, and to be their double A team, too. That was a massive step for the Bay Sox to retain that affiliation. Um, and I think what has helped the most this year, again, is just the quality of play. Like looking at Grayson Rodriguez starts and the crowd that he brings out and Adley Rutschman and all of these guys that, have been able to sell tickets for the Bay Sox just because of how high quality this team has been. It's definitely helped, you know, bring Bowie back from where they were last year. Gas them up. Yeah, ex- exactly. That was one of the most fun. Th- I was telling um, Eric, the, the Barstool, Barstool guy who uh, um, kind of had, had started a lot of that with those guys. And I, I was telling him, man, that, that was one of the most fun things that I have helped plan in my time, I mean, I've I've helped plan some stuff in my time in sports, not even just in baseball. But that night in June with Grayson Rodriguez's first night was one of the most fun things that I've ever done helping plan in sports. That was just incredible. It's a great night. Glad the yeah. fans came out and enjoyed it too. That was so cool to follow on Twitter, even. Yeah, I mean, it it was fantastic. Just just the way that everybody kind of embraced it, and and you know, it's a shame that DL Hall's been hurt too. Um, just because you feel like if, if maybe both of them had been pitching at the same time, you know, what could that have looked like? But, you know, things happen and, and hopefully DL recovers and, and recovers well and timely. And, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes and how that all plays out for sure. Talking about pitching um, and pitching coach you guys had down there in Bowie, Justin Ramsey, 
You guys have had this parade of great starting pitching that's come through Bowie all year. There's more coming up. A couple of names I want to talk about later on, but I mean, how big of an impact have you seen Justin Ramsey make on these Bowie pitching staff? Oh, the the feedback that you get from from people that know what they're talking about and how well Justin handles his pitching staff and the bullpens that they throw and the techniques that they use to improve and the conversations he has with the pitchers and the analytics that they use to improve all of that combined. I mean, there's a reason that he has had such success at each different stop that he's had. And now eventually here in Bowie at the double a level, I mean, Justin, for one, he's great. I mean, Justin and I, we talk all the time, you know, I'm I'm constantly, you know, I, I just, I find him, so interesting and what he's able to bring to the table as far as pitching goes pitching to me is such a science right i mean the pitchers and the way pitchers work everything like that it's just, it's so fun to watch pitchers work and uh his ability to get the best out of his pitchers every night is a reason you're seeing guys like kevin smith kyle bradish uh all those guys immediately get jumps up to triple a after you know, rocket fast promotions in May and going right up to triple A. It, it was, it was, you have to feel like Justin gets a lot of the credit for that. Um, the, the coaching staff here, just, you know, between him, Fuller, Britain, the rest, they've just been, they've been great in the development of all of these guys. And that's the most important thing at this level. Absolutely. And uh, speaking of development and the future, what guys are you hoping you get to see him Bowie from Aberdeen uh, to close out this season. And who are you excited to see in 2022? Well, you know, we were just talking about that. It was funny. We, you asked that we were just uh, talking about, you know, some of the guys that, you know, do you see, or, or even outside of, of Aberdeen, do you see some of these guys start to get quick promotions and maybe get a week or two at the double a level, you know, you're looking all the way to and now, certainly you're not going to get guys like Kowser or, or Kobe Mayo or some of those guys, but you know, Gunnar Henderson, Jordan Westberg, they've certainly had great seasons. Bowie could really use a middle infielder right now. I mean, Malkin Canelo and Caden Grenier are the only two middle infielders on this roster right now. Greg Cullen's hurt, Taryn Bobber's hurt, Joey Ortiz is hurt. You know, Bowie's middle infield, if Grenier or Canelo gets hurt, uh, they could slot somebody in. But those are the two middle infielders right now. So you look at, you know, like either of those guys to, to be able to uh, to come in to Bowie maybe by the end of the year. And, you know, those are certainly the two biggest names. Um, you know, the Jordan Westberg, of course, has been phenomenal. Um, and, and, you know, I know those it's maybe a cop out answer, but for the promotional level of the, of the organization and the, and the fast promotions that we've seen this year, you know, why not, why not give them a a, a couple of weeks? Um, And there's only six series left in the minor league season, right? Including this week, there's only six series left. That's how fast it's gone. And for the last six weeks for Bowie are at home. So it'd be fun to, to get to watch maybe a couple of those guys play at home. So one guy that's flown under the radar a little bit is Felix Batista, but we've certainly noticed him lately. And there's really two parts to this question, which is, first off, can you verify the height weight listing, which is on MILB.com, it's 6'5", 190. Uh, the three of us have had doubts about that. And then looking at his performance, um, do you see him as a future bullpen piece as he moves up? And do the walks concern you a little bit? Okay, so – if there was like a president of the Felix Batista fan club, you know, I don't know if I'm nominating myself for that. You know, I don't know if that's my role or what, but go for it. I mean, he only allowed one earned run in his time in Bowie right now. I mean, it, it, in, in up to now, he has allowed one earned run, right? I mean, he has just been phenomenal. He has been a lockdown guy out of the bullpen, but more importantly, Zach, to your question, I was looking at that when I was putting the roster together and I saw him come out of the bullpen for the first time and I looked over at Adam and I think I said this on the air. I said, Adam, I would be willing to bet my life's worth on the fact that this man is not 6'5", 190 pounds. I said, 6'5", 190 pounds is like an inch taller than me and a few more, you know, quarter pounders more than me. I said, 
that's one of the biggest baseball players I have ever seen in my life. And so one day I was walking down by the field. I had to you know, get something down from there and, and the guys were throwing outside and Almingo was throwing with Bautista and Bautista was on the far side of the field. And I asked Almingo, I said, yo, he's not six, five, one ninety, Right. And Almingo looked at Felix and he goes, Hey, yeah. How big are you? And Felix looks back and he goes, uh, six, seven, two seventy. And I go, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> I go, that is what I'm listing on the roster. And I was talking to Nick Vespi about it too. And I, he goes, yeah, man, we were all laughing about that because there is just no way. I mean, I mean, and, and that is, it is so funny because I mean, he's physically massive and he has an upper nineties fastball and he is just so overpowering. And the funny thing is, sometimes he'll make the game interesting. You know, the other day he had runners on the corners, but he got out of it. And he just seems to always, no matter what happens, he just always seems to get out of the jam. And uh, he he was my guy uh, that I think Orioles fans, the Orioles system really needs to start talking about and taking a look at. Um, and in his time now with Bowie, he has just been great. And I can't wait uh, to see what he does moving forward because he's just been, he has been something special. And I, I really haven't seen too much hype or chatter or anything about him. And he's just quietly put up an ERA that, I mean, in however many innings he's thrown, he's allowed one earned run. So you know, the ERA starts with a zero. You can work with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just picked up on his season he was having a few weeks ago after he struck out the side in like two consecutive games. He's given up not two hits in 13.1 innings for the you guys. Uh, it's crazy, man. I hope it's he gets ridiculous. a shot. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, I think I remember when we were at Bowie the other week, I remember he was warming up the right fielder and looking out from the press box and thinking like that. Is, I could still tell from the press box that is a very large human being. Uh, <laughs> the big so fella. That's, I can, <laughs> that's how I always <laughs> introduced him. <laughs> <laughs> like, I yeah. can only imagine what it's like to stand in a batter's box against him when he's throwing 9,900 miles an hour. Uh, but yeah, yeah. He, I, he might have been 6'5", 190 when he was signed at 16 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I want to talk about another pitcher though on the roster, Drew Rom, a new guy. Have you had the chance to meet with him and talk with him? And, and if so, what are your impressions of him? Maybe as a person as well, the, any conversation you have with him, just because it seems like he had such a dominant season in Aberdeen and he's really dominated since the Orioles drafted him, but he's very quietly just really flying under the radar. And that transition to double A seems pretty smooth. And, and so I was just wondering what your impressions of him were. Yeah, I met Drew down uh, right before, or I guess it was right after his first start, um, the day after his first start in Richmond. A uh, funny story about Drew um, that I told on the air the other day during his start. Uh, so Drew was drafted out of high school, Highlands High School in Northern Kentucky. Um, I work a lot with Highlands High School, um, not directly with them, but I do a lot of high school broadcasting in the Cincinnati area because that's where I live in the off season. And uh, so his senior year of high school in 2018 uh, the Cincinnati Reds hosted a high school showcase uh, for, you know, local high schools, bigger high school programs. And Highlands has a very, very good, uh, he may have won the state championship his senior. I know he won the region his senior year. I don't remember if he, if, if they, if the, if Highlands won the state championship, but either way um, Highlands was a part of that showcase series at great American ballpark. And I was asked to be the public address announcer that day for the game. And so little did I know at the time that Highland's starting pitcher in that game was Drew Rom. So the other day when I met him, I went up to him and I was like, obviously, dude, like we never we had not met. I, I was like, I've seen you pitch multiple times before in high school. Um, and I mean, he like I'm sure in the offseason will live right down the street from me. I, I don't know, but I'm assuming like Cincinnati is a small enough area that, uh, you know, he, he was from over in Northern Kentucky, but uh, he, you know, he, it's funny because I, I told him, I said, you know, I was on the public address for that game and now here we are in double a three years later. Uh, it's a small world. Baseball is a small world. And uh, so that was, that's kind of a fun story. So I've been getting texts and, and, you know, tweets and everything all year of people from Cincinnati reaching out, being like, "Hey, when's 
when's Drew coming up to double A? When's when are you going to call Drew's games? When's he coming up to double A? And I was like, well, you know, I don't know, but he's having a great year in Aberdeen. And now all of a sudden he comes up to uh, he comes up to Bowie and, you know, he's eight. zero in Aberdeen and he comes up to Bowie, gets a win in his first start and nine and zero on the year. Uh, and, and so he's he is just he's another one of those guys um, that you look at that they get the promotion and they just pick right up where they left off in Aberdeen. And Bowie's kind of become the Aberdeen Ironbirds here in the last few weeks. And he's just another in the long line of them this year that have had a lot of success at the double-A level. I'm sure you can relate by both being huge Cincinnati Bearcat fans, right? Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, oh my, you know, I was going to wear my Xavier shirt. I don't know what it was. I, th- I figured I'd put something plain on. But, yeah, oh, my God, no. Very much not a Cincinnati Bearcats fan. Oh, darn, know. I got that back. It's my bad. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know you're a big Ophelki Peralta fan, and obviously he got his first win in AAA this past week. But what is it about his game and his story that makes you such a big fan of his? Well, this is something that Adam and I had talked about a lot when, you know, I I like looking at players that maybe have struggled in the beginning part of their career. You know, you look at at Blaine Knight and some of the adjustments that Blaine Knight has made now to have such a successful year. You might look at Blaine Knight's record in, in, you know, his minor league career and you might say, oh my goodness. But then you look at what he's doing in double A and he's completely kind of changed his professional career around. And sort of the same thing with Ofelki Peralta, right? Where he gets signed so young. Um, he's a Latin talent. He gets signed so young. And then he comes in and he kind of struggles a little bit through his time in Frederick and maybe a little bit's a bit of a, an understatement, but he struggles. Um, and then he comes to double A and, and he's playing at the double A level. Well, now he's playing at the triple A level, but he's, he's playing now with players that are his age, instead of being the 18, 19, 20 year old, always playing against some tougher competition. He's playing with guys that are his age as he's progressed along. And, you know, that's, it's shown this year that he's, he's made so many improvements and a lot of his ERA this year came from two or three bad outings. You know, I, I would always call it when, when good Ophelki was on the mound, we would have good Ophelki that day. And when good Ophelki was on the mound, he was going out there. He was commanding his pitches, his fastball. He has a really live arm. His fastball, you know, was mid to upper nineties. Um, so, you know, when he had it rolling, he could motor through a lineup, not issue a lot of walks. Now there would be outings where, you know, he got hit around a little bit, maybe he'd walk a few batters and and his outings wouldn't last very long. You know, he didn't even get out of one inning a couple of times. Um, and, and you'll have that, but, um, to me at least, and this is maybe why he was deserving of the promotion. Um, it, it just, to me felt like the good outweighed the bad. And if he could just keep building on so many of those good performances that he had in double a, that he could be a very successful pitcher. And it was fun to watch. I, I just, I thought he was a fun pitcher to watch. We've been saying for a while now that you move him to a reliever and you shoot him up the ranks, let him hit that high 90s fastball more often than not. What do you think about that? You think he has a chance to stick as a starter or you think he's going to be a big arm out of the bullpen eventually? Well, you look at some of the starters that Bowie's or that the that the Orioles are really trying to build around right now. And, and you know, the DL Hall injury may set him back. We're not really sure about his timeline, but you look at Grayson Rodriguez, Bauman. Of course, you have John Means already up there. Uh, Bradish, Smith, all these guys that you are targeting as starters, you know, does Ofelki fit into that? And I guess that depends on his results, but certainly there is a spot for him if he can throw that fastball the way he's been throwing it with the spin rate and everything like that. There is a spot for him. Is it in the bullpen? Maybe. But, you know, I I think there is a, a spot for him that he can carve out if he keeps pitching the way he did this year in Bowie. So you just mentioned him a minute ago, so I wanted to ask about him. Blaine Knight, uh, that was a guy that I think a lot of people had ridden off a little bit after the 2019 season, but he's certainly been one of the you know, biggest surprises, I think, of 2021 with the success he's had. What adjustments has he made to get to this point? 
Well, you know, the biggest thing for me with Blaine Knight and the way he goes out and pitches is he just doesn't walk a lot of batters. His strikeout rate has been high, but he just doesn't put guys on base. He's not walking batters. And that's huge because, for one thing, you're not putting your pressure on yourself to pitch out of the stretch and to have to have these high leverage innings and things like that. But at the other perspective, looking at that, you're not putting this pressure on yourself because you're throwing strikes. You're getting outs you are you're you're striking batters out you're getting these ground balls these these weak fly balls um you, you know and, and I think we've seen a lot of that this year from Blaine when he was promoted at the same time as Grayson Rodriguez that you know he hasn't just been a starter he's done that piggyback role that the Bay Sox have done a lot of this year where they bring somebody out of the bullpen for the final four or five innings of the game um so he hasn't just been the true starter but when he's pitched he has such a, a, a command of the pitches that he throws that keeping those guys off base to me has been huge. I didn't get a chance to watch a ton of them uh, at the lower level. So I'm really just going based on what I've seen numbers wise and the analytics and everything like that. Um, but as far as all that, that changes, you know, he's been able to boost up his record this year, get some more wins if only because he's really shown an ability at the double a level um, to keep those base runners to a, to a relative minimum. I think. I want to ask about one more Bowie pitcher, and then I want I want to ask about two other guys. It's not on our outline, but I want to give you a chance to uh, come back at Bob for his Cincinnati comment there. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> Cody Sedlock, he's been hot over the last few starts. He's working really deep into games, five six innings. Fantastic job of limiting the walks. I know that was a big issue at the beginning of the year, and now he's just not walking guys. Former first round pick, top prospect that really has kind of fallen off the radar. I don't think he's on any top prospect list, and take those for what you will. But I think a lot of Orioles fans have kind of moved on from Cody Sedlock, and now he's one of the more exciting pitchers uh, down there in the upper minor leagues. Should Orioles fans be excited about Cody Sedlock again? Well, you know, I, I think if he's pitching the way he has over the last three to four starts, so that's what the Orioles really want out of him, right? I mean, his last few starts, if I look it up here, his last few starts have been great, and and the way he's been able to pitch in those starts too, and again, it, it kind of goes back to what I was just talking about where he's he's settled down more. He's been able to get out of jams. And, you know, if you look back in those last few starts, he's walked one batter, no batters, one batter, one batter, no batters. You know, so he, he's not walking. If you go back into June, you know, you see four walks, three walks, three walks. You know, all these walks in, in April, four or uh, sorry, May, you know, four walks, three walks, two walks. He's not walking, guys. And the average is down in the month of August so far in a couple of starts. Batters hitting 217 against him. His whips 0.94. So those are all numbers that are really encouraging for him. And because he's not walking, guys, he's keeping that pitch count lower. So he's able to go longer in outings. His last two outings have been his longest outings of the year, six innings on August 1st, and then five and two thirds on the 7th. So if that Cody Sedlock starts showing up and, and, and pitching that way and building on that here over the next few weeks, I mean, you know, I have no idea. Does he go up to Norfolk and get a couple of starts to finish the year? I don't know. Um, but certainly with the age and, and the way he's, he's pitched, I mean, he was a first round pick all the way back in 2016. And I know he's battled some injury issues and things like that as well, but he is 26. So, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if maybe they push him a little bit to, to give him, a, um, to give him a shot if he keeps pitching like this. Nice. Um, so I want to talk about the two Xavier guys in the system and they've been struggling recently, but having you on, you got the floor. Hype these guys up. Rylan Bannon, <laughs> Zach Lowther. <laughs> uh, what, what is it about these guys that make them such good prospects? And are you hopeful that they can turn things around? I know Lowther is injured right now, but are you hopeful these guys can turn things around to close out the 2021 season? Yeah, I mean, it was so fun to get to know those guys at Xavier and to be able to follow them here into the Orioles organization. Of course, I haven't called either one of their games. Zach and Rylan both progressed on up. But, uh, yeah, you know, Ryland being a part of the of the Manny Machado trade, that was a huge deal. And I, I remember I remember being at a bar in Cincinnati with a bunch of my Xavier friends and seeing his name scroll across the bottom of the screen. And we all looked up at it. And we were like, oh my God, Ryland was in the trade. 
And, uh, you know, I was like, man, that's a big deal for him. And then to end up out here and to produce the way he has. And, yeah, he, he has struggled a little bit. And I always thought defensively, you know, do they move him over to second base? Um, uh, I really haven't been able to follow him too much or as much as I would have liked to this year um, just because we all play at the same time. But from what I I read and see about him, yeah, you know, defensively he always had it. Um, and, and for being not the tallest guy in the organization, he always had a lot of pop in the bat too. I was always surprised, you know, even in college at Xavier, the field is very, very small. A lot of home runs are hit at Xavier's field. Um, and he was included in that. He would hit a lot of home runs in college. And so I was always surprised with kind of his stature, how many home runs he hit. And, and he wasn't just a contact, a speed guy. He was, he was a power hitter. Um, you know, he, he really had that, that tool. And and so for him to be able to do that and put it together and then play third base, he was kind of like Dorian to me. And I mentioned that earlier in this podcast, but he was like Dorian to me, where very aggressive on, on fielding balls up the line, easily throwing across his body, a very sure handed defender. And, uh, you know, if he picks the bat back up, then sure, maybe you get some time in, in the major leagues. And what can you use him in, in the middle infield? Maybe a second base if they try him out there, maybe. Um, and, and then Lowther, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, he struck out Shohei Otani, right? So that has to count for something. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I was at his major league debut totally by chance, completely by chance. I just, uh, just figured that was one of the only Oriole games I could get to this year because it was right before the Bowie season started, and the night before uh, I got the news that he was getting called up. So totally by chance. Um, but that was cool to see. Uh, you know, really cool. Xavier hasn't had a ton of major league, a few here and there, um, but hasn't had a ton of major league talent. Um, so cool to see him get up there and get into the system and, you know, wishing the best for him to, to come back. But he was just another one of those guys, high spin rate guy, doesn't have the overpowering fastball, um, but he locates his pitches really well. And he was just another left-hander that kind of fit that mold. And you were hoping a guy like him could stick and fit. And now the question is just what does he do coming back from the injury? And, and you hope that it kind of does stick a little bit more and, and he's able to regain a little bit more of that confidence and composure that you've seen. It, again, it's, it's like the good with him out vastly outweighs the bad. Um, so along those lines that that's kind of, that's kind of what I'd say for my Xavier boys. So we got a question here from uh, Sim Simkin Tribute. Besides injuries, is biggest system uh, disappointment relief pitching? Understanding MILB starters will starters will transition relief in MLB. Vespi, Batista, perhaps are exceptions. You know the Bowie bullpen has had some serious issues this year, um, but I think I think part of that is how everything's been handled with you know, the way these piggyback starts go. So, you know, you might look at a result of a game and you might say, um, you know, oh my gosh, the bullpen came in and, and blew it again or whatever. But to me, the you know, watching these guys every day, you might see the starter throw four to five innings and then the bullpen comes in, but it's really just the piggyback starter who's meant to go out there and throw their four innings. And they're going to have a longer leash than maybe a true bullpen reliever who goes out and maybe just throws one inning or, or two innings might have. But, you know, I will say, give credit to guys like Tim Naughton, who had a well over 15 ERA in the month of June. His ERA in the month of July and since is, is less than two. I mean, he is it's something around 1.8, I think 1.9. Um, he has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, and, and guys like him, um, you know, I, I think it's good to see some production here in the second half of the season from the buoy bullpen, um, just because, you know, you look at you look at other guys like Klimek and all of them. Each one of them has had their good spurts of the season. It's just a, a matter of putting it all together. Um, but I, I don't think the bullpen issues necessarily are something to really wave a huge red flag at. There may, may be a concern, but just the way that the pitching is handled now in the minor leagues, it's so different because it's so concerned about development and it's not so much about going out there and winning the games as it may have used to have been. So from that perspective, I, I think that's what I would say about the relief pitching that it just, 
I, I would focus more on the results of these of these uh, pitchers in their individual outings, their performances, how they've been able to build over the seat, and guys like Naughton that have really improved over the second half of the season. Th- things are looking up in Bowie in that perspective. So, Bob, do we have any more listener questions uh, for right now, at least? No, I think that's it for now. Should we get into our outside the top 30 prospects? Yeah, let's uh, move on to that. And um, Bob, Nick, and I, and I don't know that this was necessarily intentional, but none of us have a player from Bowie that we're going to profile. (laughs) So Paul is going to start us off this week and talk about, you know, a player or players at Bowie that he thinks are flying under the radar that we should pay closer attention to. Well, I was going to pick Felix Batista, but we already talked a lot about Felix Batista. So let's see, who can I go with that's maybe a little under the radar that is playing? You know who I will say? I got to give a shout out to Caden Grenier. And you look at his offense and you see his strikeout total and it's eye popping. And that's something he has to work on. But. His ability – I mean, he's a major league-ready defensive shortstop right now. He does stuff in the field defensively that just makes crazy plays look easy. And I know that's a cliche in broadcasting that gets overused. But Grenier's ability at shortstop is something really, really special. And I talked to him about it, and he goes, man, I just – I just practice those kinds of plays so often that it's just second nature to me. So it's good to see from, from Caden. And, and, you know, if he cuts down on that strikeout total, um, then that's a potential middle infield guy that you could look at going forward. So that's my pick. All right. Well, I'm going to go a little bit lower in the system all the way to the FCL talking about another pitcher. Uh, it's kind of like Gene Pinto, who's impressive of late. Raul Rangel, or Rang, I don't know how you pronounce his last name. I'm sorry. Uh, he's 18 years old, listed at 6'3", 150. So he's definitely got room to grow into that frame there. But he's 0-1 with a 2.45 ERA on the season, over 22 innings. He's only given up uh, 20 hits, 6 walks, and he's got 29 strikeouts. And He's kind of at a position where Pinto was before he got called up to Delmarva, where I'm hoping he gets the call to full season ball and can we can get a better look at what he's got, what his stuff that he's dealing with, because the numbers are there. And if he's anything like Gene Pinto, then we will be <laughs> very excited by what we see, because I'm still in love with Gene Pinto. Yeah, so my pick this week is Brandon Young. And if you've heard us talk about the undrafted free agent class from 2020, you've probably heard us mention Young's name. Very good at Del Marva, was promoted to Aberdeen last month, really struggled in his first outing, but his last two outings have been better. Now, he pitched Sunday, and the outing was suspended because of rain, so he only got two innings in. But in those two innings, three strikeouts, one hit, no runs, and perhaps most importantly, one walk. After walking three batters in two and two-thirds in his first start at Aberdeen, he's had one uh, walk in each of his last two outings, both of which have been starts. So I think... If he keeps the walk numbers down, we're going to see him repeat what he did at Delmarva at Aberdeen for the rest of the way. Yeah, watching Brandon Young was awesome. And I like what Sam Jelinek, the broadcaster over for the Delmarva Shorebirds, said that in Young's last outing at Aberdeen was probably his worst statistical outing of the year. But he had talked to Brandon after the start and said that this was one of – he actually felt that's the best he had felt all season. Uh, so you love to hear that. Uh, I'm going with a guy who I hope to see in Bowie very soon – and that's another catcher. To, I know Bowie needs a, needs another catcher there. Uh, Maverick Hanley down at Aberdeen. Um, he's healthy. He was on the IL for about a week there, but he's healthy now. Over his last four games, he's five for twelve with a home run, seven RBIs, uh, four walks, just five strikeouts. He's hitting four seventeen. He got a stolen base. I think he has twelve stolen bases on the year. Anyone who listens to this show regularly knows I love Maverick Hanley. I think him and Adley Rutschman can be a great one-two combo in the major leagues. So it's great to see him back healthy and uh, hitting the ball well. It's the offense that we had a lot of questions about, and he's uh, answering a lot of those questions so far. Um, but I don't know if you guys had anything else uh, for Paul before we go, but I have one more thing, and I want to ask, uh, can you describe Adam Pohl in just one word? Is that possible? No, absolutely not. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We've been on here for about an hour uh, I'm not sure if I could describe Adam Pohl in an hour, um, but, but no, I, I, you know, Adam, just, just as a, as a note on Adam, I mean, Adam has been a tremendous help to me, his ability to weave stories into a broadcast, uh, his ability to, 
you know, talk about the players. I mean, he has such a wealth of knowledge about the organization and the system because he's been around with the keys and with the base. I mean, he has been with the Orioles for so long. The references he can bring up to past prospects and draft picks and and everything like that, I, I think is such an asset to the minor league broadcasts here in Bowie. I know I have learned a ton from him and, and his ability to, uh, like I said, tell stories that when the game's eight to three on a Sunday afternoon and it's 90 degrees out and, you know, it, and it's the seventh inning to, to keep the games interesting and to do anything like that. I, Adam has been a absolutely massive help for me. I, I feel like he's made me a better broadcaster. He's a fantastic guy to get to know. I know he loves tweeting back and forth with everybody um, but he's he's somebody that the Orioles system is really lucky to have in their system because he cares about the Orioles so much. He grew up an Orioles fan. Um, so, you know, I know everybody around the, the team and the system loves him. So, you know, Adam, I know that is way more than one word, but I did have to give a, a big a big help to my guy, Adam, because he's been, you know, especially in my first year in affiliated ball where I've taken on a lot of the responsibility with broadcasting this year. You know, he's been a huge help to me in learning how to do a lot of that and uh, making me, you know, even outside of just the on air stuff. I mean, there's so much that people don't realize that goes into broadcasting with game notes and, and social media and graphics and, 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 you know, I, I'm not so much on the graphic side, but you know, with the public relations and setting up interviews and anything like that, like that goes into that. And, and you got to, you got to have learn by experience and Adam's been great with all of that. So, so uh, yeah, you know, Adam, I, I don't know if you're listening now or if he's listening later, but he'll be listening at some point. So shout out to our guy, Adam, because he's been great this year as always. Yeah, Paul, we really enjoy the work that you and Adam do. Can you tell our listeners where they can uh, follow you on Twitter and where they can listen to you and Adam call Bay Sox games? Sure. Yeah. So, so my Twitter, if you're looking down here, it's just my, my name right here, Paul Fritchner. It's all one word. The great thing about being one of the only Fritchners in the world is that the usernames are always available. Uh, so Paul Fritchner on there. And then, um, yeah, I, uh, you can watch the games on MILB TV when we're home. Um, or you can watch them anywhere, but if you want to listen to us, you can watch them when they're home. And then, um, there is a link online. If you just go to baysox.com, there's a listen live link under the team tab or every game. We've also started doing this year to make it more accessible to people. We've started putting them on uh, Twitter, Facebook, and on our new Baysox YouTube page. So anywhere on there that you want to listen to the games, if you just check in for a second, leave us a comment. It's been great this year, getting a lot of people commenting in that they're listening. Um, it's been, it's been a fantastic first year in this organization getting to know everybody interact with everybody on Twitter. That's, that's why I do this. I love interacting with the fans. It's great. So I appreciate you guys having me on. This has been a lot of fun. Absolutely. Yeah, You're in running for rookie of the year. That's <laughs> Perfect. Great. I love it. Well, thank you, Paul, so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we will be back next week and we're actually going to be taking a deep dive into the Florida complex league when Eric Garfield joins us. So we're looking forward to that show. Uh, we appreciate Paul's appearance tonight. And for Nick Stevens and Elvin, uh, make sure to check out BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com for all the latest articles there, including Bob's latest three ups, three down, and down the farm pieces. Join the message board um, and join the discussion on the Ravens, Orioles, and other sports. And be sure to follow us on Twitter. Cincinnati at Bearcats. PSL on the Verge. <laughs> <laughs> for uh, Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens, this is Zach Spedden. You've been listening to On the Verge. At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial-grade supplies for every industry with same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help. So you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.